Hey everybody, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dave Ward, as uh, the voice of God just said. And uh, as cool as that talk was about open source hardware, I wanna talk to you about a huge change going on in the industry now around open source networking. And it's, we've been working on this together as an industry for about the last six years, and we're here, and it's now. And I can't thank our partner Red Hat enough about how much they've helped us with this journey. And so as many folks understand, in this audience that that difference today between what customers are looking for and that innovation is in fact where open source fits that particular piece. And that's how we've fundamentally changed our strategy inside Cisco to embrace open source and to also uh, contribute widely. So towards that end, we've fundamentally changed our portfolio. We've changed the way that we do engineering, not only to integrate open source into our portfolio, which we've done for, for over a decade, but also to contribute back to help move the industry forward on the trajectory that, that we all need to be on. And so that's what I want to spend most of my time talking about today. And so the target assumption of the application developers in the audience is that, for the love of God, will the infrastructure just do what I need it to do? And do I need to learn everything there is to know about SDN and all the orchestration stacks out there just to get my job done? And we've been spending a lot of time trying to make that happen. When you take a look at the slide behind me, you see the services and orchestration in that downward arrow on the left-hand side. That, in a nutshell, is the entire SDN movement of the last seven years, that one arrow. Can we program that infrastructure? And what's been interesting is that we've, we had to evolve the architecture, frankly, of the internet to open source parts of networking, to invent telemetry or data coming out of the infrastructure, and then fundamentally change the way that we operate this infrastructure through the use of analytics, of course, and create this reactive or proactive wheel that as the infrastructure, as the state of the infrastructure changes, the orchestration elements and where containers and hypervisors are placed and how all of this interacts to create a workload or workflow running on compute platforms can work as efficiently as possible. So let's take a look at this for a second. As an architect at Cisco, I'm required to put up a diagram that, like this, which shows the slicing and dicing of all the different layers that we're talking about. Um, physical infrastructure at the bottom, how the cables are connected through the physical topology, virtual overlays, service overlays, how to create the policy for this. The whole stack movement that's been talked about is that an application developer would need to know everything that's going on on how to orchestrate every edge and node of every one of those layers behind me. Somebody's not writing an application if they need to, or working on a workflow, or solving their business objective if they need to do all these pieces. So my, my argument is that the whole stack can't fit in anybody's, can't fit in any one individual's head, let alone somebody who's just trying to get their job done. So I've drawn that blue line. And my argument is that the world should have a no-stack developer. And the target that we're working on in open source and with the industry is to have that clear blue line where below a service broker or a PaaS layer, where application developers are working in OpenShift or Cloud Foundry or other PaaS layers, every, the infrastructure can please do what I'm asking it to do and don't bother me with it. Just get it done the way I want to. Now, working at Cisco, of course, in a networking company, we'll talk about networking quite a bit, I find it really strange that even in some of these orchestration layers, you can dial up compute, you can dial up RAM, you can dial up storage. That's all great, but today, in the state of the art, you can't even dial up bandwidth. So if your workflow needs a certain amount of guaranteed bandwidth that it's gonna um, consume or that it's gonna produce back to the rest of the network, please let me just express one aspect of networking and have that be the bandwidth that's necessary. We've got 64,000 other features that you can configure as well, but let's start with a simple one. How much bandwidth that you could consume or produce? And so towards this end, below that line, and what the industry's been working on for, for six or seven years, has been, as you can read here, a metric boatload of elements that are necessary to have that infrastructure, have the virtual appliances or the network, uh, virtualized network functions or the network-related containers, et cetera, actually operate and function to deliver the intent that a service designer, workflow designer, or application developer is actually trying to create. This has been a ton of work. 
six years ago, four years ago, the industry didn't even have these terms and these functions as part of their language. And so it's been a huge revolution in the networking side and in the orchestration side as well. So towards that end, let's just talk about a couple things as data centers are evolving. And in particular, the, the, all those lower layers of the physical underlay and the virtual overlay and the service overlay, what's really interesting about these is in the move from using layer two or VLANs to connect hypervisors or workloads, whether on bare metal hypervisors or containers together, you ended up with a stack on the left-hand side of headers going across the network that were completely operating ships in the night. And you couldn't actually debug and operate and understand how, where connectivity was flowing, where traffic was flowing, or the relationship between if a port was bad or a piece of fiber or something like this. So my next argument is that this happens to be a great use for IPv6 and building IP data centers. A flat addressing map where everything from containers to applications to compute to storage to networking and all those layers evaporate because you have a single addressing scheme to be able to connect them all. And it's incredibly easy to operate. This may, in fact, be the killer app for IPv6, and we've all been looking for one. Um, but in fact, when building out these networks, getting rid of that ships in the night header stack to a, to a single flat addressing map is absolutely killer. So towards this end, looking at service brokering and guaranteeing those workflow resources, this is where we've been spending a lot of time at Cisco and in the industry as well bring the data path in with the compute, RAM, and storage resources that can be allocated and engineered, and integrate those into those higher layer systems so they're just considered services. Because I actually think it's a, the industry is really not in a healthy state with the amount of capability that's available either in most service brokers or in PaaS layers today. And it's, it's really kind of nascent functionality. So towards that end, we've worked with the industry and with Red Hat to open source a low-level bit banging, packet flinging forwarder for, for switching routing, but it's right at the lowest layers. And the reason why I say this is, as most folks know, if you're deploying hypervisors or containers, they're either connected via L2, maybe you're doing uh, kernel bridging, maybe you're, maybe you're using a virtual switch, but that sw virtual switch doesn't necessarily have the scale, performance, capability, delay, jitter that you're looking for and we wanted to help solve this problem for the industry to move it forward. So to do this, let me give you a couple, couple of numbers uh, out there. Basically, what, be, being in the networking industry for quite a while, we can populate any size forwarding table of layer two, V4, or V6, and have completely flat line rate performance. And so here's V6, it's the same for V4, any size table, and this forwarding plane can forward it. When taking a look at L2, same thing. Now, here's what I want to pause just for a second. On a pedestrian four-socket computer, 24 cores are used across those four sockets, leaving 48 cores to do actual work, and we're able to flip 480 gigs full duplex through that forwarding plane. So even the most intensive or intense I.O. workflows um, we think we can solve and, and remediate some of these problems. And an example would be in media and content production where 4K uncompressed video is, is operating at around 13 gigs. And when you get to 8K and you get to 3D and you get to multi-view, you actually get well over uh, 50 gig to, to 80 gig concatenated streams. And so performance in the workloads, looking at some of them specifically, is quite key. So when we turn on filters, which has often been a part of the conversation, or ACLs, we actually only go down to 462 gigs full duplex from 480 gigs when starting to turn on some features. Now, max delay has been something that we've been talking about as a networking industry for a while, because in other virtualized switches, there can be greater than 120 milliseconds of delay trying to get it through the, the I.O. stack. And that's causing a lot of applications and workloads and workflows to actually cause fits. Looking at a long-term soak test, the max outlier of this forwarding plane is actually at three and a half milliseconds. And so it's a dramatic change in almost getting to the point of deterministic networking and software. So as we step forward, a couple last things I just want to say on this. 
We open source this because we want to move the industry forward and enable all the tools and technologies that we've been using in the industry to build networks to be able to be built in data centers and an orchestrated workflow. So everything you need for v4 and v6, for L2, for MPLS, every encapsulation known to mankind, we open sourced it to have those tools in our, in our toolbox to be able to build the applications and, and workflows that we need to. And so you can find more at FDIO and, and FIDO. So as I take a couple more steps forward, and we go back to this wheel for a second, we've covered some aspects of orchestration, the open and SDN, the networking, telemetry, we've fundamentally overhauled how data is coming out of the network and out of the core infrastructure. And, it, and if you're familiar with this as an IT pro, you'll know that you've got to actually instantiate a number of collectors, loggers that are uncorrelated and uncorrelatable today. So, hey, let's, let's actually apply uh, analytics and an analytics infrastructure for this because right now, even when trying to get the data, how did my workflow perform? How should I be able to, how can, what is the best way to spread my application across multiple data centers? It's really not in good shape to get that data out of the infrastructure and out of those uh, virtual overlay and service overlay. And all of this is data that can be produced and can be pushed out of the network and out of the infrastructure to be able to help you build a better workflow. So towards this end, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be open sourcing something called the Platform for Network Data Analytics, where it's a midstream project with all of the currently used um, connect, sorry, connectors for all the currently used data sources that exist in a data center or in the network today and bring this into an integrated, tested, highly available scale-out system to be able to collect that such that you can perform correlated fault performance resource and event analytics on top of this. And so this is a picture. If you can, if you can read this, you're going to see that it's, again, a midstream project of a number of other open source projects. And we're also running an experiment on this, which uh, may, may, may not be new to some. But in the foundation space, we're open sourcing this without creating a foundation, without requiring dues, and instead making this about uh, the developers and the community around this. Many of us have foundation fatigue. But the overall goal of building this is actually to get to workflow service impact analysis. Again, where I can take all of the data sources that are currently generating information that I don't have access to readily to be able to determine how and where to place my workflow, how my workflow is actually performing, and how my infrastructure is actually performing. So shifting a little bit, but putting it all together, I want to just remind everybody that we're talking about, you can see the horizontal line below the applications and business outcomes, orchestration and lifecycle management on the left-hand side going down into the network and coming out uh, into the platform for network data analytics and moving the industry forward and the service brokers and PaaS layers uh, in the industry. The reason why this is critical, and just giving a quick recap of history, when you look at any one of the elements of this puzzle or of this wheel, you recall that the networking industry and compute industry has said, we're going to open up APIs to our platforms, and a huge developer community will form around this, and we play kitty soccer and go there. And then SDN controllers come by, and the SDN controller vendors or, or communities will say, look, the entire developer community will form here. Rinse and repeat with the potential for analytics. And there's no doubt that there will be communities that form around these specific platforms, but we've got to remember that the action is actually above that line. And as we've discussed in several breakout section, sessions across the street, the services that we want to bring up to that PaaS layer or into that service broker layer become the, not only the services possible to build in a workflow, but also enable folks to create the business outcomes that they want out of that PaaS layer. If we can get all, everything below this blue line to just do what an application developer wants it to do without having to learn everything to make it happen. And so we've, we've built out these pieces. And what it turns out to in building into service broker platforms and heading towards this target, you can actually build out and create a PaaS layer and a service broker layer that actually brings out these specific pieces from creating the service broker to the catalog to the service assurance application 
And this is what we're targeting bringing, uh, bringing into OpenShift and Cloud Foundry as an example. The way that we instantiate it as products, just quickly, are in several types of complete stacks that can be delivered, and we, and we deliver these with Red Hat as well. But I don't want to create just a product pitch, but instead I want to talk about how open source has enabled this to happen. About two years ago, there was very few projects actually trying to integrate any of these infrastructure pieces or orchestrating networking at all. And over the last two years, there's just been a ton of foundations and projects that have formed. And that's as you can see on, the, on this slide. But what's interesting is that what is the success of these? I mean, we have a zillion foundations coming up all the time and a, and a ton of new projects at, at all different layers has been described. What is the success of these? Well, some of the major ones that we've contributed to, we've contributed a significant amount of code to try and uh, move the industry forward, as I said, and continue to put our resources behind open source as it is that innovation engine that we need to keep feeding. <clears throat> a couple of major projects, um, Open Daylight, for example, that we work with Red Hat and across the industry, OPNFV, which just had a summit last week in Berlin, uh, FIDO, uh, FD.io, as I mentioned on that forwarding plane, and in OpenStack, these are where some key things are happening. But the space that we all need to take a look at and watch is the networking architecture around containers and microservices, as it's still really quite nascent. And if some folks were at um, other conferences that happened just a couple weeks ago, realized that it's an extremely hot topic. And right now, we're not able to solve some of those fundamental problems of being able to create tenants and, and isolate hive swarms and cells. But nonetheless, many of these projects are incredibly successful. Give you a quick bit of recap again. In 2015, this would have been a diagram of the, of the orchestration stack that would have been possible um, and that has been built by the industry. And many of these foundations, many of these projects look like in the previous slide as just points of light. But in fact, they have been actually integrated together in working towards a stack. As we move forward into this year, several other new projects actually have been brought under governance for open source to be able to set them on a trajectory uh, in which we can have a larger commuter community. And again, the stack continues to expand. And as we look forward, uh, going towards the second half of this year, there's a couple of key projects and to, create, and to fill out that wheel, that platform for network data analytics and getting that data into the into the PaaS and service broker layer is really critical. So when we take a look at the overall open networking architecture that's been built really in an incredibly short period of time and a huge transition for the networking industry, these, these layers and these elements of the overall architecture are how these different open source projects fit in. In many cases, some of the open source projects are, are actually overlapping, and that's a good thing right now as we don't know the winners, we don't know how vibrant the community is going to be, and we don't know how the functionality is going to evolve. But nonetheless, here's, here's where the industry is currently focusing on, on solving some of these problems. Again, my overall argument is that stack is really complex. And it's not complex because a bunch of folks really like complexity, it's complex because as you recall from earlier slides, there's a lot that it has to do to be able to, to enable an application developer to do their job and, and get to the point where they can say, infrastructure, just do what I need. It's got to be stable. I need, all those, I need all the controllers, orchestration, the programmable interfaces, APIs, et cetera, all to be built, to be integrated, and to be utilized. And that's, that's how the industry and community is working uh, towards that goal um, and really trying to hit a number of unifying releases of OPNFV, Open Daylight, and VPP in September. And critically, bringing the notion of infrastructure and workflow analytics all the way to the top of the PaaS layer that can be consumed. So just in sum, I just want to hit on this one more time. Overall, everything below the applications and business outcomes, we're trying to drive to a point where it's do what I need. Don't make me learn and understand every aspect of all this infrastructure underneath, from the lifecycle management through the, through, the, uh, through the infrastructure on whatever choice is chosen and whichever implementation of the, of the different core infrastructure of which hypervisor you're going to use or which container uh, microservices mechanism, 
bring that out into a platform of analytics and present that directly to somebody who's trying to write an application and create a business outcome. So thank you all very much for the time today and uh, enjoy the show.